Hi, good afternoon. Happy birthday. Well, I thank you. Happy Founders yeah. Day and hello to the students tuning in. I want to take a moment to introduce them as well as our speakers and myself and what we're here to do today. For students who are tuning in, I understand we are going to see 8th graders from Andover, Kansas, 5th graders from Reston, Virginia, and students from Pleasanton, Nevada. Welcome to Monticello's live podcast with Crystal Safety Classrooms and happy birthday, Thomas Jefferson. Well, thank you and I thank you all for gathering. Uh, in the reception of my birthday. What a great honor it is particularly to think that uh, I can remain here on my little mountain Monticello uh, and speak with you across uh, this great continent, uh, our great nation. Thank you. Let me take a moment to introduce our panel and if you'd like to scoot in a little bit we'll get you in the frame. Mr. Barker has portrayed Thomas Jefferson in a variety of settings for more than 30 years. In addition to portraying Mr. Jefferson for Colonial Williamsburg, he has performed at landmarks and historic sites including the White House, U.S. Capitol, National Archives, FBI Headquarters, NASA Headquarters, the Palace of Versailles, and throughout the United States, Great Britain, and France. I'm impressed. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Barker, My for being pleasure. here. Mr. Sandling is the Vice President for Education and Visitor Programs here at Monticello. An alumnus of the Teach for America program, Gary taught middle school social studies in Louisiana and is a trained historian. And I'm Jacqueline Langholtz, manager of school and group programs here at Monticello. I'm delighted to be celebrating Thomas Jefferson's 271st birthday with you. You don't look a day over 270. Here via Google Connected Classrooms. Our theme today is celebrating Thomas Jefferson by celebrating the birth of our nation. During this session, I'll be asking both Mr. Sandling and Mr. Barker, uh, excuse me, Mr. Jefferson, uh, yes. questions we've received from classrooms like yours. But first, I have a few of my own, so if you'll allow me. Mr. Jefferson, you are remembered as a founding father, man of the Enlightenment, self-taught architect, plantation owner, scientist, and so much more. Can you talk about what you feel were your most significant accomplishments? Well, I think that uh, the cultivation of the soil is certainly a most worthy vocation. Uh, after all, you are providing for your food, the food for your family, the food for your nation. So I do think uh, farming is, uh, is a most honorable vocation. But as I have been a farmer my entire life, what I have been able to cultivate and create, uh, the more so than food, is liberty and freedom. So I think I would like to be remembered uh, as the author of our Declaration of American Independence, providing a greater freedom not only for all of us as Americans, but for the family of man across this globe than has ever been known before in human history. I would like to be known as the author of the Statute of Virginia for religious freedom, so that man may be more free to carry his religious opinion than he has ever been in his entire life before. And I would like to be known as the father of the University of Virginia. To be able to found a university yes. in order to provoke and enlighten the mind, uh, I think is a great gift that I, I have been able to create for my fellow man. Well, those are all worthy. Can we talk about the first one first? Yes. Declaration of Independence. OK, Mr. Jefferson, the words, all men are created equal, can be heard echoed throughout American history. And we can talk more about mm -hmm. uh, what those documents and events were. The power of that phrase continues to reverberate around the world today. Why do you think those words are so powerful? And why is the Declaration of Independence such an important document? Because we boldly pronounce what we ought to understand in our heart and our conscience uh, is a truth, a fact, if you will, of this entire universe. And that is that we are all born equal. It certainly does not mean that we are all born equal in face and form. I'm very happy that Ms. Langholz does not look like me. That's to your benefit, I, I may like say. You. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Nor are we created equal in mind. Uh, some of us have minds that are a bit quicker, others of us have to take our time. But the point is, are we all born free in nature? Well, of course we are. As the birds and the trees, the flora, the fauna, we are all created equal in nature. That is the law of nature and nature's God. So we are free to declare, you see, and therefore we must declare that these are the inherent rights. 
uh, that are given to each and every soul upon this globe. Now, maybe, Mr. Sandling, you and I can talk about that a little bit more. Yes. And, uh, we were talking before this broadcast about that phrase, all men created equal, and, and we were thinking about some of the more famous speeches and documents that we've seen it in, notably uh, Rights and Sentiments at Seneca Falls for Women's Right to Vote, yes. uh, the Gettysburg Address, which we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of, 19, uh, 1863, yes. correct? Um, 50, 100 years exactly, pardon me, after that, in 1963, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, Martin Luther King, yes. that goes that phrase, and we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of that, and then I was watching the um, second inaugural address by um, our President Obama, and he quoted that phrase numerous times. So can you talk a little bit more about that phrase? and um, The all men are created equal yeah, phrase. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Jefferson, of course, recalls that the Declaration of Independence was written in a time of war. It was written in a time uh, where the need for assistance to ensure our independence from Great Britain might occur, and for all the nations of the earth to understand that this would be a new nation, a free nation. But that phrase that we all, and you know it too, probably, uh, all men are created equal, has become a powerful one, and it was used... Uh, not long, uh, you know, let's say 50 years, 60 years after it was first written, it would be used by a group in New York, a group of women primarily, to declare their equality to men. Yes, Mr. Jefferson, their their equality to men um, in the in in the in the political, as we might say, in the in in things politic, for example, um, as well as then. Most interestingly, let's talk to Mr. Jefferson about this. So, so there is a president that will come, a man named Mr. Lincoln. He was a, he was but a, he was but born, in fact, just as you were leaving the, the presidency. So, was he born then, the spring of eighteen oh nine, or early on in that early, year? Early on in that year. Well, that's when I left the presidency. I turned the gavel over to to Mr. Madison on the fourth of March. 1809. And you had a snowy ride back to Monticello. A very as snowy I ride, yes. yes. It took me quite some time. And he he would use uh, this phrase, in fact, very famously um, in something called the Gettysburg Address. The Gettysburg Address. And, and when did you say this is written? Well, he begins the address by saying, four score and seven years ago, Four score and seven years ago, and what year would that have been that he is saying this? In 1863. Well, correct. four score and seven years ago, before 1863, a score being 20 years, four score and seven, that would be 1776. Yes, it would. Isn't that remarkable? These words would be used then as well in the midst of a different American crisis. And then these words would be used in the March on Washington. Um, so uh, um, there was a large gathering of people in Washington City um, in order to to uh, change some laws, in fact, to ensure equal opportunity for jobs of people of all races. And um, which presidential monument was behind Martin Luther King when he gave that address? Ah, it was the one to President Lincoln. That's right. Mm. So there are some monuments in Washington City now, you Mr. Got Jefferson. One. You have you, one, too. One. Well, <laughs> I, I care not to have a special monument by any means. I hope that our nation, let alone our Declaration of American Independence, may be the monument by which the rest of the world may understand uh, we own up to the principles upon which our nation has been founded. Maybe let's talk about, uh, Ms. Langholz, about uh, why it is that we have Mr. Jefferson. We we have Mr. Jefferson with us today. Here today. What's so special about uh, why we're all gathered here today? Sure. Well, um, earlier this morning there was a big party on the West Lawn, which is pictured behind you here. So we're doing this broadcast from Monticello's classroom spaces, where we invite students when they're on their field trips uh, to do school programs. But there was a big party in your honor, and the fife and drum corps was there, and we had distinguished speakers, and uh, we celebrated your 271st birthday, and I enjoyed some delicious cake to celebrate <laughs> you, um, and it's an event where uh, we celebrate you and, and your legacy, and we appreciate you being here to help us celebrate that, too. So as, as we talk about birthdays, though, as I describe that, and again, I can't say enough how delicious that cake was, three-tiered 
cake with columns and everything. Oh, my. Of the Corinthian, of the Corinthian order. Yes, well, I'm delighted to hear it was classical. I presume yeah. that it had somewhat of a French recipe. Yes, uh, it was so airy. The icing lovely. was perfect. Uh, so here at Thomas Jefferson's home of Monticello, we commemorate your birthday with a wreath ceremony and a public celebration on the West Lawn. However, I understand you did not celebrate your own birthday. You said instead, and I quote, the only birthday I ever commemorate is that of our independence, the 4th of July. So, Mr. Jefferson, why does July 4th mean uh, so much to you? What does it mean to you? And why do you consider it more important than your own birthday? Well, when I was a young child, of course, we were not yet these United States of America. No matter where our families came from, whether from France or the Italys or the Germanys, uh, let alone Great Britain, we were all considered Englishmen. And we had to celebrate the king's birthday, the monarch's birthday. The celebration was usually the very first weekend in December. Uh, that was a composite, if you will, of the birthdays of all of the British kings and queens. Well, we are certainly no longer... British, and we are certainly not a monarchy. So why should we recognize one individual's birthday, even if they hold the highest office in this land, which, by the way, they would not hold unless they receive the approbation of the people, that is, that the people would agree. Why should we celebrate one person's birthday over and above the birthday of our nation? So I, I believe to celebrate the, the birth of our nation it should be the very first and foremost celebration, if you will, that uh, we recognize each year. Can I still celebrate my birthday then? Oh, I'd say I plan you, on you are more free to celebrate your birthday whenever you want than okay. you'd be anywhere else on this globe. Okay, and you'll be there? I would be delighted okay. to be there. <laughs> so, But if I may ask, Mr. Jefferson, uh, you remember, of course, that there were, it was not unusual in the early years of our country to celebrate the birthday, for example, of General Washington. No. It was celebrated um, when he was president. Um, it was also celebrated when President Adams was president no. at times, much to much sometimes to uh, President, president Adams was a little disappointed about that. But it was celebrated. But when you came it to be elected um, to the presidency, what did you do to help celebrate? The, in other words, you were you, in fact, if I remember correctly, you let it be. You would not even tell people when your birthday was. That's right. That's and right. but instead, um, we you would celebrate the Fourth of July in Washington City. Tell us a little bit about the celebration of the Fourth of July when you were president in in Washington City. Well, do you know, Mr. Sandling, I cannot help but remember that indeed, as many wanted to celebrate not only President Washington's birthday but President Adams as well, uh, that President Adams believed the true birthday of our nation is the 2nd of July, not the 4th. Oh no, that was, that was truly the day, the 2nd of July, 1776, when we voted for independency. And Mr. Adams believed we should celebrate the 2nd of July each year with massed bands and bonfires and, and parades. Well, that was his own opinion, and I cannot deny it was an important date. But we did not truly secure uh, what we voted for on the 2nd of July until we voted upon the reasons uh, why we ah. separated from England uh, when we voted to proclaim to the rest of the world the philosophy upon which our nation uh, is founded and particularly when we voted on the compact to maintain uh, these United States. So that is why I consider the 4th of July to be the true birthday of our nation. Now you ask me, uh, how did we celebrate? I simply opened the president's house to the people. After all, this is a celebration on behalf of all of the people who hold our government in their hands. Uh, without the people, our government would govern over nobody. Uh, it is the people who allow our government to, be, to exist. So I opened the doors of the president's house and I shook hands with, I think I counted 3,000 American citizens who came to visit me in the president's house. Would that we could have had the cake that you said uh, was served. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would have been quite lovely. 
And there were parades and music, is that parades, true? Parades, yes, and we, oh, we had a brass band. I always have enjoyed a brass band. And do you know, uh, in my first inauguration, I was still living in a boarding house. I had not yet moved into the president's is house. Is that like we would call a hotel room, uh, maybe? A hotel, like a that hotel. is correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, here I walked out of doors to walk down but two blocks to the as yet unfinished Capitol building, then I was not only accompanied by quite a number of the people, but also uh, the Marine Band. Mm. Uh, a number of Marines in our Marine Corps uh, enjoyed playing the instruments uh, that they had learned uh, from the time of their youth, and they greeted me with a special serenade as we walked two blocks to the Capitol building. So upon that occasion, I formally uh, named the Marine Band the president's own. So yes, on that particular 4th of July, 1801, my first as president, yes. opening the president's house to everyone, the Marine Band was there to play the president's own. That is fascinating. And what do you think the 4th of July means to, well, to you, Mr. Jefferson, and, and to those who, who were part of the revolutionary generation, what the, well, perhaps I should just ask you to speak for yourself. What does the 4th of July mean to you? Uh, it reminds us, as it, I hope it does, as it reminds me, uh, that the ball of liberty continues to roll round the globe, that all eyes are opening and will continue to open to the inherent rights of man, meaning simply, as we discussed earlier, that all men are born free. That all men, and that means all mankind. It includes the ladies, of course. He means, he means girls and women. <laughs> I, I do. Everyone. We're all born free. We speak of mankind. And that means everyone across this globe. And that is what our nation is dedicated to, uh, well, to pronounce boldly and hold tightly as indeed a charge, a charge on our behalf, our responsibility on behalf of the rest of the world. Mr. Okay. Sandling. Yes. What does July 4th mean to you? It's a good question. July 4th means to me that it's a time, it's a day where we can all remember, and that's us and all of you can remember what it is, the, the rights that make us Americans, the rights that we think are so important, as well as our responsibilities, the things we are to do because we have those rights, like we can, when you get older, you can vote, um, that you can participate in government, you can protest when you think something should be done differently. That's, that's what it means to me. And, and I like to do this every year on the 4th of July, Mr. Jefferson. I like to read the Declaration of Independence out loud. I think that's a really uh, enjoyable way to be reminded of what the 4th of July means. Hmm. What about you? Uh, well, much of the same. And I like getting together with friends and family, mm -hmm. honestly. It's the fireworks and the togetherness and the freedom to have a hot dog or a veggie dog. I think you might have a veggie dog, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, you right? will have to explain it to me. I'll have to serve you one. I'll have to serve you one. But this is what we'd actually like to do at Monticello, is we'd like to gather answers from participating students and teachers who are viewing this broadcast either live or later, um, and hear from them what July 4th means to them, because That's that right. can be a very personal answer, and it can vary person to person. Um, so I'm actually going to walk you through a, a challenge that we'd like you to do when this broadcast ends, and we will check the website, and uh, my colleagues and I, and I want to introduce Melanie, if you'd like to get on the screen real fast. Melanie and I Hi. will be reading <laughs> all of the answers that are posted, and we're going to choose uh, the most outstanding answers, and we're going to send a, a thank you gift for participating from Monticello to uh, those students who uh, give us some really thoughtful answers. Um, but let me walk you through a little bit, and I'll try to do it as a screen share, and if not, I have some visuals that I can hold up. But we posted this question, what does July 4th mean to you, to a new website that Monticello has launched. And the website, and I hope you like this name, Mr. Jefferson, it's called The Sea of Liberty. Oh, The Sea of Liberty. Yeah, Hello. and that actually comes from a quote of yours. Yes. I don't know if you'll recall writing this, but you, you once said, the boisterous Sea of Liberty is never without a... Storm or tempest. Absolutely Very right. Good. Absolutely right. So it's never without a wave. It's not going to be easy. Um, but we thought that was an inspirational image to think of when, when we think about um, liberty and self-governance today. And those are the main topics of the website. So it uses 
primary source documents and images, a rich collection of these, and then is constantly being populated with new challenges and lesson plans from teachers around the nation and honestly around the globe for middle and high school students. And then we want to see your work. In other words, we want to show off your good thinking yeah. about these questions on the website so you can share them with your friends, your parents, teachers, uh, in case they don't think you're actually learning anything. We want you to prove that you are. Yeah. So let me see if I can pull up a screenshot. Here we go. Ooh, something really fancy just happened. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna log in here to seaofliberty.org, and we are signed in. From this main website, I'm gonna go to Teach. Teach is for teachers. And then it's one of our featured challenges here. I could also click on Declaration Double Take. I'm going to click on What Does July 4th Mean to You? And here's the challenge question. July 4th brings to mind fireworks. Somebody probably said fireworks parades. You said parades. Parade. And I said picnics. But what are we celebrating when we remember the signing of the Declaration of Independence? What does July 4th mean to you? And then there are instructions there for completing the challenge. So we look forward to seeing your responses on the website and we will check back in for that. Um, so if you feel ready, we have a little bit of time left over and what we have are some questions that were submitted by um, classes that are not on the live broadcast today and then we also have students in front of us who may have questions of their own. So let's start with students in front of us who may have questions of their own and I'm going to ask that um, when we call on your class, you that class that's being selected can turn on their microphone and that way we'll be able to hear them, okay? So maybe if I go ahead and pull this up, do you think that's a good idea here? Mm -hmm. So this would be Nebraska. Let's hear, let's hear from students in Nebraska. Okay, we have one. Stand up and introduce yourself. I'm Kylie and why do you want to be a president? Oh, why? And could you repeat the question? Yes, the young lady asked me why did I want to be a president? <laughs> Well, that is a very good question, I, I must say, but I must tell you this, truly, it is not so much why I wanted to be a president as it is why the people wanted me to be a president. Now, simply because an individual says, I want to be president, uh, doesn't mean that that might occur. Uh, they must convince people that they will do a good job as president, that they will protect and defend all of the people, not just one, or the other singly or solely, no, but a protection for every citizen in our nation. Now, I may believe that I am capable of doing that, but then, of course, so may someone else. So it is up to whom to decide, then, amongst all of the different choices, who should be the president of our nation, who should be the president of all of the people. So truly, uh, it's not so much that I wanted to be, it is the simple fact, the people wanted me to be. Nebraska, while you have the floor, do you have another question for Mr. Jefferson or Mr. Stanley? Yes, we do. Um, my name is Bridget, and when was Monticello built? Uh, well, thank you, Bridget, for asking me the question about when was Monticello built. I would say that uh, there's not one particular day in which the entire mansion house was built, but that it has been built over many days, many months, many years, and many decades. That means 10 years at a time. I do remember, though I was not born on this little mountain, uh, that when I was a young boy and born nearby, about two miles to the northwest, on a farm known as Shadwell, that you could hardly walk out the front door of Shadwell House without seeing the little mountain in the distance, as if it beckoned me to, to climb it and ascend it. And, and that I did as a young boy. And there, as a young boy, I had the idea that someday I would like to live on top of this mountain, to be able to see uh, in great distances and vistas, particularly the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains uh, to the west. Uh, so. In 1768, uh, when I was uh, 25 years of age, I then leveled 
the top of the mountain off. So that was a beginning in 1768. And rather than a very large mansion house, I built a very small one-room cottage. Oh, I referred to it as my hermitage. And I lived inside this one room, which was my bedchamber, kitchen, hall, study, cabinet as well, until I was married. And then I brought my, my wife uh, to live with me in that little cottage. But by then, 1772, I was already beginning to build the big house, the mansion house. And that's been altered many, many times. In fact, truly, I do not believe I am finished with it. I enjoy too much of pulling down and building up to be completed any project. I've heard it said that architecture is your supreme delight. It is my supreme <laughs> delight. I, after all, we enjoy providing our, our habitation. And truly, do we ever finish accumulating things? <laughs> so your house and your room will continue to grow as you grow with what you acquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Um, let's now switch to uh, turning on the speaker in Andover, Kansas. We have eighth graders. If you'd like to ask a question, we're happy to take it. Why don't you want to be remembered for being a president? <laughs> Why do I not wish to be remembered for being a president? That's a very good question. Because I am not the only president. Uh -huh. There were two presidents before me, and I am hopeful there will be many, many, many other presidents after me. And can you imagine as well, the more presidents we have, well, mm -hmm. it becomes the more difficult to remember who was president and when. But that is the nature of our nation. That is what we are all about. That as a child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40. Our laws and our institutions grow as we grow, as a people. So how significant it may be that I am president as at a particular time uh, it makes no matter when we consider the many eras, the many ages, and the fact that our population grows. After all, when I was president, our women folk could not vote. <laughs> Do you think that someday there may be a woman who is president? And who would then ever want to remember me if we have our first female president? True. But there can only be one primary author of the Declaration of Independence. Well, one I thank you for Statute, that. One father of the University of Virginia. Well, true. But, but then remember, I was one of five men appointed to a committee to write the Declaration. In fact, we thought Dr. Franklin would initially be the author. Mm. But I remember he said he was growing too old to have anything else he may write and suffer the scrutiny of a committee. He looked at me the same time Mr. Adams did. It was truly Mr. Adams who said, I think Mr. Jefferson writes better than anyone else in Congress. And he reminded everyone a Virginian ought to be at the head of this business. But they did proofread your document a little bit, right? Well, that's what a Would committee that is all. That's yes, what they is. certainly right. did. And many had opinions as to how it might be changed, particularly Mr. Adams. You might or, recognize that. Well, that's my first draft. And there it is. It took me uh, three days to write the first draft of the Declaration on four sheets of paper. This is only two sheets of paper right here. I wrote on four. And the reason it took me so long is, well, I suffer as we all do by making mistakes. Is it easy to erase ink? I had to cross out, as you may see, my mistakes and write the corrections above or beneath it. At the end of the day, I could not even read my own corrections. I had to transcribe it that evening and then continue the next day. So three days uh, to write our declaration. You can keep that. You well, thank that. you. I want it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and over Kansas, that was a great question. Do you have one more for Mr. Jefferson? Yeah. Um, why did you own slaves, but yet you were against slavery? Good question. Very good question. I can only answer. I was born into the society of slave owners. Uh, I inherited the great majority of my slaves from both my father and my father-in-law. And so therefore, coming into the inheritance of what we know is a bad habit, a bad custom, and which is also secured by law, well, how much longer can it continue? And what a great burden and responsibility one has on their shoulders to decide how 
we ought to eradicate this, how we ought to end it after it has been with us for so long. There is no easy or immediate method. And in fact, were I to break the laws and free all of my people, I, I rarely refer to them as slaves, they are my people, well then they would be the victims of my neighbors, many of whom who do not want to get rid of their slaves. Uh, and they would try to capture my slaves. They would tar and feather them, perhaps kill them. It would be more an act of inhumanity than it would ever be an act of freedom. So my, my opinion is, Rather than break the law, let us build a consensus that is a general agreement to change the law. And that will not happen overnight, particularly when we realize most people have not the opportunity you all have, and that is an education. Oh, education, more than anything else, will help us to better understand one and the other, help us to understand our differences of opinion, and help us to understand what can bring us all together in order to better our lives. And that means for everyone. So I beg pardon that, uh, that I do continue to own slaves. And truly, the deeper in debt I have become, my slaves are now more the property of my creditors than they are my own. Uh, so this is a great challenge I must face up to. But then remember, so must our entire nation. I even wonder, Mr. Sandling, do you want to add anything to that answer on behalf of Monticello and how we interpret Jefferson and slavery today? Because it is one of the major things Sure, we talk about. yeah, it's a good question. We think it's one that's, it's a question that we all ask and that certainly when you visit here, it's a question you will overhear many visitors say, not just uh, folks like you in school, but adults as well. And, you know, we know that for Mr. Jefferson and for his generation, there were some people who were very adamant that there should be abolition, that their slaves should be freed immediately and there were others who had great concern about it. Uh, there, was, uh, there were many practical challenges with manumission, uh, but the free population of African Americans began to grow even in places like Virginia, where slavery was still, of course, legal. Um, and as we all know, Mr. Jefferson himself, late in life, uh, was asked to comment on the Missouri Compromise, oh. which some of you have learned about. They know, they, these, some of these students know about mm. the Compromise in 1820, Mr. Mm. Jefferson, that essentially meant that slavery would be allowed to persist in the southern states, but would not for any new states admitted to the Union. Like all of you in Kansas, you know about this. You know about the bloody war, the Jayhawker Wars that came out of this eventually. But what did you fear would happen if slavery was oh. left in one part of the country, but not... Uh, in another. Well, well, this is just the point, Mr. Sandling. We were drawing a line across our nation, particularly out west in what I hoped would be the new empire of liberty, uh, that is the Louisiana Territory. Now, can you imagine, in a nation devoted to the principles of li liberty and freedom for all, that we are drawing a line to decide who should be free and who will continue not to be free? Good heavens, this was an abomination, and I wrote when I learned about the Missouri Compromise, and I had great faith in Senator uh, Clay to reconcile this. After all, we both read law with Mr. George Witt. I thought he would understand the necessity of allowing Missouri to come in as a free stray state, but no, it did not happen. And I wrote, this is now a fire bell in the night. An alarm, if you will, and all I fear, do not see that speck on our horizon which will someday fall upon us as a great tornado. Hmm. You know what I was thinking could happen in the future by simply gross, crossing a, uh, drawing a line. Someone's going to cross it, and that can only result in conflict, battle, or a great war. Well, as we like to do, let's bring everything home to Virginia. So our students so, uh, in Virginia, you have the floor. Let's have the floor. All right. Who has a question? I'm going to start with fifth grade. Any fifth grader? You guys have all done Jamestown, and I want to have you think about what you would like. Go. All right, we'll start with Allison. Nice and loud and loud. clear and Over slow. This way. Um, you say in the Declaration of Independence, you say all men are created equal. What about African Americans? Oh. So it was all men are created equal. How do you feel about African Americans or slaves? In the, None. 
Nonetheless, Nonetheless, they are absolutely all mankind is created equal. Uh, as you heard me mention earlier, it does not mean that we are created equal in face and form, uh, nor are we all of one particular color or of one particular mental capacity. Some of us have minds that are sharper and more quick than others uh, that must take their time. But yes, all mankind, regardless of their color, regardless of their religious opinion, regardless of their language, we are all born free into this world. Unfortunately, it is not the laws of nature and nature's God that conflict. It is the laws of man. And that is why we, education is so necessary to help us understand how we can correct the laws of man that do an injustice, uh, provide greater freedom for some, uh, whereas not for others. So no, no, whether one is of African-American heritage, uh, whether one is of Germanic heritage or Asian, uh, if you will, we are all born equal. We are all created equal. Okay, Reston, Virginia, do you have another question? We do. We're going to have her come a little closer. So, if you're saying all men are created equal, <laughs> sorry, but why weren't you thinking about like the African American slaves when you wrote that? We were. In fact, we were thinking about the. I mean, because he's saying all men are created equal, but at the time they weren't because some were born into slavery. You're absolutely right. And so I ask you, is that the law of nature, nature's God, or is that the law of man that is conflicting? We are, we are pronouncing boldly what we consider to be the laws of nature and of nature's God. We are all his children. We are all the family of man across this globe. I should not be silent upon that subject, nor not write anything about it. As I said earlier, we are born free to declare. And therefore, we must declare that these are the inherent rights of man. Oh, I know that many might uh, say that is a contradiction, that is a great hypocrisy. But mind you, they are certainly free to say this while we are free to answer and help explain that these principles expressed in our Declaration of American Independence apply to everyone, particularly those who are enslaved, that we might thereby make it better uh, for them uh, or certainly for future generations. Uh, and it will take quite some time to break old habits and old customs, particularly to change the law. Well, you might be thinking what I'm thinking, yeah. but I mean, Mr. Peterson, you get a lot of heat for contradiction in your own life, mainly because you penned this phrase that is so powerful that we continue to echo. But I, I was going to ask, do we feel that we've arrived at a good stopping point? I mean, are rights <laughs> equal for all today? And is it only about looking back and saying, well, why didn't you do this or that? I'm, I, well, I'll say one of the things that keeps me motivated and inspired working here at Monticello is thinking about how those words are applicable today. Absolutely right. The reason is simply the work is not done. I, I have tried to do as best as I can during the time that I occupy this globe. But as I have always said, the earth belongs to the living, living. generation. Yes. Uh, the dead hold no power over us. Uh, and therefore, the past is so important that we remember where we have been in order to better understand where we are and surely where we must proceed and where we must go. That is why I've always said if we can institute a universal system of education in our nation, and I fear that I may live not to witness that, but it does appear that you have the opportunity, and if we can have a system of education throughout our nation, history should be our first read so that we do not forget where we have been in order to better understand our charge and our responsibility to continue to move forward and make these principles of equality applicable, that is to apply to every single individual. And that is why I've often said <laughs> uh, freedom uh, requires a, a vigilance and a constant attendance to it. Um, and this is why, in fact, we think it's important for all of you to look at and think about these, how other people took Mr. Jefferson's famous words and used them to achieve the very thing that you're asking him about. Because he understood, and Americans over time have understood in a variety of ways, how they can do something to change those circumstances with that promise that all are created equal. And they didn't just wait for someone to uh, agree to it, 
they they organize to find ways to make it happen. I, I must tell you, I have to admit this, and I, I'm not ready to uh, to so easily admit my faults, although uh, one is the more honest right. when they do. Uh, Though I may not live to see the end of slavery, I have written that I may not witness it. Uh, I even question if it is achieved, can we live free and equal? I question that, and perhaps it is because I have been so much a victim of my own time and my own world, of my own habits and my own customs, that I wonder whether a free and equal may be a possibility in the future. But do you know, that is now for you all to bear witness to and for you to decide I hope I may be proven wrong I truly do uh, so that you see is your work and your charge in order to move forward upon what I have tried to achieve in my time okay and we'll take one more question from uh, Reston Virginia if you have one prepared I see someone standing at the mic yes we do have it so um, after purchasing the Louisiana Purchase, what did you do with that land? That's a very good question. And and though you would want to think that I was the one that purchased it, oh, I hardly have enough money to expend on such a great purchase, uh, uh, not only for the island of New Orleans, but over 830,000 square miles west of the Mississippi River. No, no, though very interested that we had that opportunity and could achieve to double, some say triple the size of our nation, it was our Congress, it was the Senate uh, of our Congress that ratified the Louisiana Treaty. The first thing we did, of course, was to seek loans because we could hardly afford it ourselves. So we had to receive loans in order to provide uh, for that purchase. Uh, the Dutch loaned us money. England loaned us money. The second thing we did was to make certain that we could provide the proper boundaries uh, of the Louisiana Territory. How far west does it stretch? How far to the southwest does it stretch? We certainly know that the Mississippi River is the eastern boundary, but what may be the northwestern boundary? So that had to be uh, certified and validated. The second thing was applying a gov or the third thing was applying a government to the entire territory of Louisiana. Can you imagine trying to govern over 830,000 square miles? So we split it in half. Uh, we provided for the northern part of Louisiana uh, and the southern part of Louisiana, and I appointed governors to attend to the uh, administration uh, of that new territory. Then, of course, uh, after that, providing free settlement, providing the opportunity to acquire land for American citizens. And you can imagine, as I wanted to think of this as our new empire of liberty, I certainly did not want many citizens bringing their goods and chattels in slaves uh, to the Western land. But even a president cannot deny one's rightful ownership of property, even though I do believe it is a misnomer to, to think that an individual could be called a property. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so glad we've been able to take live questions. And as I look at the questions that were submitted by students, many of them overlap. So I think. We can call this a successful Google Connected Classroom, the first, hopefully, of many. Thank you for coming here, sharing your birthday. And it is on Sunday, is that right, April 13th? Well, April 13th. But then, of course, uh, when I was born, we were not, uh, we did not accept Pope Gregory the 13th's calendar. No, you see, when I was born, Great Britain, as we were considered Englishmen, were still using Julius Caesar's calendar. So I was born on the 2nd of April in 1743. Uh, but then nine years later, when Great Britain accepted Pope Gregory's calendar, well, then I added 11 days and celebrate my birthday on the 13th. I think, I think you're trying to get two birthdays. It was July 4th. I think you're trying to get three birthdays. Can't stand it. Three birthdays? <laughs> well, don't tell anyone Sorry. if I can enjoy. Students, we'll give you a round of applause. Thank you so Thank much you. for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. All right. Oh, thank you for the clap. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wave. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. We'll see you on Okay. Confirm exit.